crazying other bands on the early 80s L.A. metal scene was no easy task. But in 83, Wasp did it by establishing a tradition of throwing raw meat at their fans. Health department be damned. We were looking for a way to literally strike fear in their hearts. But that seemed to be the most crude form that we could think of. The crowd dug it so much, they started returning the favor. We started at first, it's true, but after a while, it started reciprocating. It started coming back around the other way, and we never dreamed that it would start coming back the way it did. It seemed that their choice of things to, to bring to the shows was liver. I don't know why. We never used liver. But when it hit the stage, it was really slick. And if you stepped in, boom, you were gone. Soon, fans were winging a whole butcher shop variety of cuts. We were in uh, Quebec. And I turned around, and I saw this thing in on the lights and moving all of a sudden. And I can't make out what it is. And it was a moose hind quarter. Wasp had created a big, bloody, messy monster. Be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. Metal and red meat are two great tastes that usually go great together. But not for Wasp guitarist Chris Hall. At a 1984 Wasp show in Europe, an audience member lobbed a frozen rump roast at Chris's head and connected. I'd get it on the microphone, I'd do a little rap about the song, and the cue was, if you mm, like a beast, you must be an animal. On the word animal, Chris would go immediately into the song. That was his cue. The thing was about the size of a football or a basketball. He got up and he did the song, but he said he never felt it. Metal turned phallic symbolism into a true art form. I used to work in a special effects house and came up with a lot of the special effects. But Blackie Lawless and Wasp turned that imagery into something even more grand. One of them was this cod piece that would shoot fire. With that flaming cod piece, the Wasp lead singer was willing to put his unit in major peril. There's a button with a battery pack on the side, and it ignites the, the, the piece, and it goes off. But at one show in the 80s, the whole thing backfired. Dublin, Ireland, 1986. The sound man in the middle of the arena said he felt the explosion, and it knocked him back. It actually picked me up off the floor probably a foot. I mean, I was airborne. Blackie's crotch rocket had exploded and set his legs on fire. I've got hair missing on my legs now that it's never grown back. I mean, it burnt me pretty bad. Somebody says, what's it feel like? I says, well, spread your legs and have somebody come up with about a size 36 Louisville Slugger and hit you as hard as they can. <laughs> That's what it felt like. And I thought immediately I'd been turned into a soprano. I made the joke afterwards. I'm sitting in the dressing room. I mean, I'm burnt to hell. I'm black all over. I looked around at everybody. I said, you know what? We wrote better songs. We wouldn't have to do crap like this. No, not like you think. You know, somebody asked, a kid asked me one time, he says, what do you think about when you're on stage? And I says, getting off. And he says, wow, you mean you get, you get high when you're out there? I go, no. I says, I'm thinking about getting off of that stage. He looked at me real puzzled, and he says, what do you mean? I says, I says when you were in school, I says, you, you do physical education. I says, if you ever ran for a test, you ran so hard you thought you were going to throw up, and he says, yeah. I says, that's what I feel like from about the second song on. I'm giving it physically everything I have. I mean, when people look at me out there, you know, two songs into it, I look like I just stepped out of a shower. And whether it's me or whoever it may be, anyone that gets to that where they look that way, 
they're putting out a lot of physical energy. So, you know, I told them, I says, you know, I just, I want to get off that stage because that's what I feel like from about the second song onward. And he says, well, do you ever get nervous when you're out there? I said, yeah, but not for the reasons you think. You know, I'm not nervous because of the people. I know that the beast is waiting for me out there. And the beast is the all-time winner and still champion is pain. Temat idag är alltså VASP och förutom Mosan så blev ju VASP känd för en hel del andra saker. De hade på scen med sig, det var lite dödskallar och lite cirkelsågar och svärd och framförallt blod. Vi ska testa idag att går det att koka kaffe på något annat än traditionellt vatten? Vi tänkte faktiskt använda blod. Vi kan ju fråga mannen själv att vad hände egentligen med alla de här pinobänkarna och cirkelsågsbetten och de här dödskallarna som var fyllda av blod. Vad är de nu? Vad händer med dem? You want to evolve and you want to grow and you want to change things as you go. You know, you don't want to try to keep doing the same thing. You know, you want to try to stay in the same sort of um, maybe the same general idea of where you started, but you want to try to have it evolve. You know, and I wish I would have had Elvis 20 years ago. I wish I would have thought it up. You know, I mean, it's there's nothing like it and it's such a simple idea you know i was i was looking at a door one day and i went to open it and it had one of those springs on the bottom so it, it doesn't crash into the wall behind it. and so it kind of goes bang, 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 like that and i looked at that and i went Ooh. elvis was born right there you know so it's, it's always the simple ideas the way that it's done like that you know but i mean if somebody would have told me 20 years ago you're going to have this microphone stand that looks like something out of Pirates of the Caribbean and you're going to get around on the top of it and you're going to ride it around, you know, I would have never believed it. But it's it's a simple idea, but it's then again, the saw blades were a simple idea too. You know, it's usually those are the best. You know, I think they're, because of the simplicity, people can relate to it more. Här är alla ingredienser. Vi har kaffekoppar, vi har en metallväktarna mugg som vi sen ska bjuda av det här kaffet åt, åt Blacky Lawless. En för Blacky, en för Chris. oss, en för Chris Holmes. Och en för Frankie Banali. Some nights you have more energy than others. But if you have 100% energy, you're going to give 100%. If you only have 90%, then you give 90%. You, you, your tank is dry whenever you come off. So it's, there's nervousness, but for very, very different reasons. It's, it's, it's never because of the people. Because I look at the people kind of like a boxing match. You know, it's, they're a boxer and I'm a boxer and I'm going out there to knock them out. I'm going out there to hurt them. You know, and the only way you can do that is you have to mentally and physically beat up on them. That's the only way you can do it. I had somebody ask me or tell me one time that was working for um, Ringling Brothers Circus back in America. He says, Come, we were talking about the idea of, of how you can mentally bear down on an audience and, and really control an audience. Some performers can do it better than others. He says, I'm going to give you a, a perfect example. He says, come with me and watch this. And we went out to watch the Lion Tamers. And here's a guy in a cage with maybe a dozen lions and tigers in there and he's got a whip and a chair and that's all he had and he says do you think for one minute that those tigers are afraid of that whip he says it's the mental communication that he has with them he is imposing his will on those cats he says that's how he controls them he says you want to be able to work an audience watch a lion tamer and I never forgot that and it's a very similar situation when you go out in front of 10,000 people the only way that you can control that audience is that your mind has to be very very strong has to be stronger than theirs you have to impose your will on them 
Blacki tykkäs kahden. Hanging with me today in the VH1 Classic Studio is someone who I've known for quite a while and been a fan of his music for even longer, Blackie Lawless of Wasp. Thank you, sir, for having me. S someone who metal fans certainly don't need any introduction to. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. What have the members of Wasp been up to lately? Well, in addition to headlining the current American Metal Blast 2005 tour, they recently recorded The Neon God, a concept album so epic it was released in two parts, part one, The Rise, and part two, The Demise. So Blackie, obviously everyone's very excited about this upcoming tour, which we'll get into a little bit later in the hour. But first I wanna ask you about The Neon God, because I spoke to you just when you were getting ready to write the first installment mm -hmm. of it. And I know it's a, a project that's very near and dear to your heart, obviously very ambitious because it's in two parts. It's not the first concept record that you've done, but what was the inspiration for this one? Well, I was looking for what I thought was the biggest idea that is the greatest common denominator between everybody, you know, and which is, who am I? Where am I going? Does my life have meaning? Does it have no meaning? Is there a God? Is there no God? I took all those questions and put them into one idea, which is, oh, tell me, my Lord, why am I here? And I think that's probably the single biggest question that we ask ourselves all the time you know it's the thing we think about the most but talk about the least because it frightens us and then which is natural you know but it's all about that journey that we're all on and we're all trying to figure it out you know and i'm in the same boat with everybody else i feel like i have very general taste even though the shows that we've done in the past have been deemed eclectic i just feel like i got real general taste i like the same music the same food the same movies everybody else likes you know so i'm real average when it comes to that and if i'm thinking about an idea that i'm moved by then there's probably a pretty good chance that there's a lot of other people going to feel like that i had done the crimson idol back in 91 92 sure. and to be honest with you it took me 10 years to get up my courage to face that beast again because there's huge huge pieces of your soul that you leave on a record like that whenever you do it and it takes all your concentration all your courage to do something like that because you see it's not just trying to tell a story that you think you can identify with and other people can identify with to do that you have to go in that dark little closet and you've got to stay there you've got to become that entity you have to write you know as it's it's method acting effectively but you're also writing at the same time but also when you're doing that you know when you dare to do a record that is not just a normal record, you're sticking your head up above the crowd. If you do a regular record and it fails, well, then you go back to the drawing board and you make another one. But if you tell the world that you're going to do something big and epic prior to doing that and it fails, if you succeed, the world will worship you. If you fail, you go down in flames. <laughs> when you come out of it, I mean, you're nuts. There's no question. Yeah. You know, it's just you don't know who you are anymore. And, and it's it's a tough thing to tour behind a concept record, especially as ambitious as something like the Neon God being in two parts, because people inevitably want to see you do all the hits. But I'm sure it's Correct. important for you to be able to do these songs. How do you have you ever thought about maybe doing some of the concept stuff maybe in another arena maybe trying to do it on stage or do it as a movie? Is there, I those... think you know first things first you have to wait to see what the reaction of the audience is going to be. But we had seen other bands release things in two you know in as one record before you know the Wall, Quadrophenia, sure. uh, things like that. And by the time you can tour the world. You know, that record is effectively over, but by the time you get to Asia or whatever, it may be you spend three months in Europe, you spend three months in America, you go to South America, you go to Asia, there's a huge wide world out there. And by the time you get there a year later, that record may be over already. Mm -hmm. So we thought, all right, we're going to stagger it in parts and we're going to see what the reaction is by keeping as an ongoing prog uh, work in progress, you know, when we go from town to town to town. I mean, we just literally last week got back from South America. You know doing that down there so it's like it's easier we found to do something like that to stagger the releases but all that being said you never want to say never but I doubt very seriously I will ever do anything like that again in my career mm -hmm. it just like I said I mean there's there's blood all over those tracks 
and that blood belongs to me, and I, I intend on keeping what little bit I have left now. Blackie, obviously everybody knows the, the Wasp shows are just, you know, so well known. Talk about the earliest days, though, of those theatrics when you did a lot of that stuff that we were talking about at the top. Uh, what was the inspiration for it? Where did you kind of, you know, where was your influence for it to do a stage show? You like know, that? we tell people the truth on this, and they find it hard to believe because when we were first starting, we had a very, and still do have a very dark sense of humor, you know? I mean, the things that we think are hysterical, some people find offensive. But in reality, out of that dark sense of humor came a want to entertain ourselves. So we asked ourselves, what do we want to do? Because we knew we had a very short attention span. So we said, all right, let's do this, this, and this. And to be honest with you, we thought we really honestly felt that the rock community would look at it and go, oh, wow, that's really radical, man. It's really cool. But it wasn't until we heard the term shock rock for the first time. We were actually shocked when we heard that because we didn't believe that what we was doing was shocking. Mm -hmm. You know, so like I said, we thought that the metal community or the rock community would look and go, wow, man, it's really cool, you know, it's blah, 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 blah. but it was unt not until the parents got a hold of it, they put that turn to it. And we thought, what are they talking about? I mean, what's really shocking about what we're doing? We didn't get it. We didn't see what they were talking about. Because you got to understand the reason that parents feel the way they do towards the kids and the kids feel the way they do. You got a 15 year old, he walks in a room, he's got this splash all over his shirt and this t shirt that he's wearing. He's announcing who he is and what he's thinking before he ever opens his mouth. The reason he's, the parents think he's rebelling is because this kid at 15 years old is smarter than they're giving him credit for because he's looked at his parents in that framework being deceived by their government, being browbeat every day in the job that they're working in, they become sedate, they become browbeaten. And he's looking at that and he's thinking, you know what, I don't want to be like that for nothing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go against everything they're telling me I should be, therefore parents see as what we do as dangerous. There's one thing though I got to ask you because you talk about your dark sense of humor and I remember something you said to me years ago that just uh, still cracks me up when I hear it. You talked about your stage show and you said jokingly, you said, you know, if I wrote better songs, we wouldn't have to do this stuff. Yeah, well, that was after the cod piece blew up and I was sitting in a dressing room with my ass all burnt up, you know. You know, that makes you say things you don't really want to say, you know. When you're looking, you know, but, you know what, I'm wearing jeans right now, nobody can see it, but I still have no hair on my legs right now. They've, it's never grown back since that incident. Right. So, uh, but that being know. said, Joe, all, all kidding aside, that's the one thing about Wasp that's somewhat always bothered me as a fan is like you know you hear wasp and you hear about the cod piece and the raw meat and all this stuff but people forget man you've written some great songs and without the songs you can have the greatest stage show in the world it's not gonna matter now blackie we didn't talk about music videos but i know especially in the early days of wasp with i want to be somebody and love machine music videos was a really big support system for Wasp and obviously you, the image of the band and the theatrics lent themselves so well to it uh, what were some of your favorite moments some of your favorite personal videos that you've done throughout the career of Wasp probably you know the, in the early days probably blind in Texas there's a scene in the beginning of that where I'm crawling through the desert and there's a rattlesnake and you can't really tell the way the video is cut but that rattlesnake was about five feet away from me. And I'm crawling through the desert and I've got my head down and the director says, get closer. And so I inch a little bit closer. He says, you gotta get closer. I can't get you both in the shot. And I go, man, you wanna get closer, you come in here and you get closer. Cause I'm, once you, if you've ever heard that sound, there's one thing hearing it on TV, but when you hear it live, up close and personal, and you hear that zzzz, you gonna, you don't ever want to hear it again you know so that's that's my memory of that but other than that it was a three-day shoot and it's funny because the third day we we only had just a few hours sleep and there's a, another scene where I'm going through the saloon doors and a sheriff grabs me and starts shaking me and I had to have a little bit of help to get through that last day of shooting and I had drank probably the better part of a fifth of vodka. And when that, when the sheriff started shaking me, I was seeing three or four of them at that point there. So I don't remember much about the end of it. Yeah, I remember you telling me in the past that you were inebriated during blind Texas. Oh yeah, literally. You know, well, like I said, it wasn't. It was necessity. It was in medicinal purposes. Right. It was for the part. That's Absolutely. right. And we should mention to people too about the tour. You're very much with this American Metal Blast tour, very much doing, for the most part, a Wasp Greatest Hits set. Right. It's going to yeah. be well you know I, 
I think every artist or every band has to be careful when they go out not to concentrate too much on a new record because in reality, let's be honest, that becomes self-indulgent because you have people that have been fans for a long time and any band that's had a, 20, a 10 or 20 year history or 30 year history, every time they release a new record, that becomes their own worst competition because they are now competing with stuff that people have had 20 years to romance in their minds. You know, every, you know, people remember where they were in the back of their dad's pickup, you know, listening to Love Machine with their boyfriend or their girlfriend doing whatever. You know, so not only do you have the song to compete with, now you've got that moment that's sure. crystallized in their mind. They're remembering forever. So they're looking for that. So. When you play new material, it's got to compete against all that older stuff they've had years of romance in their mind. Plus, with the fact that maybe there's a good amount of people in that audience don't even have that new record yet. Right. So any artist or any band has to be careful about how self-indulgent they become playing new material on, on any tour. Because like I said, if you don't, you're going to alienate a lot of that audience. Final question before I let you go. Are we going to see the Raw Meat again this year? You'll have to come to see. <laughs> on that note, Blackie, thanks so much.